things, I think that will make you very competitive. Okay. I think we should move on yeah. to the next one. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Trouteau, who works for ARG Conservation, and she will present a larger New Markets uh, tax credit, I guess a blended project, right? Um, yeah, blended, um, sorry. Uh, blended tax credit project along with uh, low income? Okay, uh, so Jennifer, feel free. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be here because I love to talk about this project and um, tax credit projects are really one of my favorite things to do. Um, I think part of that is because a lot of the work that we end up doing, like CEQA reviews and things like that, the, the objective is not how do we do the best um, adaptive reuse or the best rehabilitation that we can do, but how can I not meet this threshold and end up violating CEQA? So this is really much more rewarding because it's a very long-term relationship that you end up in with the building, with the developer, with the architect, and you really get a lot of time to sort of work out the details of the, of the project as it's going through construction, as it's going through the documentation process. And above everything else, it's just highly collaborative. So I think that that's what makes it rewarding for me um, <clears throat> as a consultant. So. Um, this is a project that Architectural Resources Group had in our office from, I think I went to the first meeting in the, uh, uh, the end of 2011, and then we were in it for a good four years after that. This was a, um, a five-year phased project, which I'll talk about. So the building is um, located right here. It's a former hospital. And uh, you can see this is Hollenbeck Park in Los Angeles. This is Boyle Heights. The LA River is kind of over here, and this is the Five Freeway. So if you get off at the 4th Street exit and then go south along the park, that's where you end up. You've probably even seen it from the Five and not realized what it was. But this is a really important community landmark. And you can see it's got this really prominent um, situation right over the park, the historic park, um, close to Roosevelt High School. Um, you know, it's, it's got this great location. And it has been, had been sitting abandoned since like 1992 or something. I mean, it was really a disaster for the community to have this building um, just kind of sitting there doing nothing. Um, I shouldn't say nothing because it was a very, very popular location for uh, filming. And if you Google the name of the building, if you Google Santa Fe Coastland Hospital or Linda Vista Hospital, which it was known at, you'll get this whole crazy um, thing kind of popping up at you from the internet that you just won't believe. So <laughs> the building was in really bad condition and that just made it more popular for uh, uh, hospital and horror story kind of films. Every kind of A, B and uh, C movie and television show you can imagine was filmed there. So it's not that it was completely derelict, but it was serving basically no use for the community. Uh, and it was a bit of an eyesore and it was dangerous, frankly, because people were trying to get in there at night and do like, you know, haunted adventures and things like that. <laughs> so um, the building started out in 1905. It was constructed. Um, you can see this is Hollenbeck Park in the foreground here and here. That's uh, Santa Fe. Um, sorry, uh, uh, St. Louis Street right in front of it. Um, this looks very different than it looks now because this is the 1905 building, which eventually burned down. So in, <laughs> this isn't what, this isn't the building we were dealing with. Um, the building that we were dealing with uh, is this building here from 1938, which replaced this building. These are two views from a similar angles. So you can sort of see uh, how it changed. Um, so what had happened was it had been built in phases. Um, the original building in 1905, and then they added to it this wing in 1924. And then the 1905 building burned down and it was replaced by this 1938 building. There's also on the site uh, a 1930 Norse's dormitory that I'll get to in a second. But you can see this property had a lot of potential. It has these incredible views of downtown Los Angeles and Hollenbeck Park. And so what had happened was prior to 2008 and the economic downturn, it had been owned by a property owner who intended to make it loft housing. So um, everybody wanted to be loft housing or everybody wanted loft housing and this building looked like a good candidate for it. So um, there was a lot of concern over the years during its sort of derelict period. Um, and so there was community concern enough that it was listed as a historic cultural monument in the city of Los Angeles. And then this developer who wanted to develop loft housing and do a tax credit project ended up getting it listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So that was already in place. 
um, because the first question you always got to ask with these with these projects is do I have a building that's eligible for the National Register because it, that's the only ones that are eligible for the tax credit so um, yes yeah eligible so that's going to be part of your process is getting it listed so after 2008, this developer realized that the loft housing idea was not going to pencil out for him and sold it uh, to a developer called Amcal Multi-Housing. Now, Amcal uh, did not have any experience with historic buildings. They had a lot of experience with housing and they had a lot of resources to call in for partners um, to make this project happen. This was actually the second time they'd attempted to acquire the building and make a project happen and the second time they managed to do it. So Amkel had as their architect, um, KFA, who are very, very deeply experienced with um, housing, obviously, but also with uh, um, historic um, adaptive reuse projects and with uh, the tax credit project. So they already knew what the parameters were. They knew what was going to fly and what wasn't. Then their whole approach to the project was sensitive to the fact that it was a historic resource. So. Um, they brought in KFA. I actually called us and brought in ARG as the preservation consultants. Uh, they do their own contracting, so Am Amcal General Contractors was the contractor, and then they had a nonprofit partner, which was necessary because of the low income tax credits, and that was the East LA Community Corporation. So there was a lot of investment from a lot of people in this project. So um, this was actually a pr public private partnership, and there's a long list of all the funders that helped to kind of make this whole thing feasible. The Federal Neighborhood Stabilization Program funds came in, Federal Historic Preservation Tax Credits, which we'll talk about, state administered low income housing tax credits local tax exempt bonds issued by the city of Los Angeles, local affordable housing trust fund administered by Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department, and also private equity from Union Bank and um, JP Morgan Chase. So it took a lot of, uh, there's a very complex structure here. And I was thinking as Chris was talking that this is, you know, any tax credit is kind of like a big polyhedron where you're only looking at part of it. And there's all kinds of facets of it around the back that you're not even seeing. And they would hand me these numbers and, I would say, well, you know, what's your QRE total? And then they would somehow come up with it. And I'd think, well, I don't know how they did that, but I'm really glad I didn't have to get involved with that. So uh, really just knowing your team and knowing that you've got people you can rely on, whether it's attorneys or tax specialists or whatever, to kind of make all these things happen uh, is really critical. So um, the uh, this was a phased project, as we mentioned. Um, a phased project has to be completed within 60 months. So from the time that you start construction to the time you get your certificate of occupancy, um, you have uh, you have 60 months to do it. So phase one was a um, let's see. This is this is phase one down here. The um, this is the nurses' dormitory that was part of the property. So the the hospital was built for um, it was built by the Santa Fe uh, the Santa Fe Coastlines, which is basically sort of the western. Um, uh, organization of the uh, the Santa Fe Railway, and they had their own healthcare system. And there were a number of Santa Fe hospitals around the country. This was one of them. There are not very many of them, especially not very many left. So it was basically it was it was listed in the National Register under Criterion One because of it. It had this important uh, role in um, sort of corporate healthcare, the very early stages of corporate healthcare. So. Um, that's why there's a nurse's dormitory on the property. It was basically functioning partly as a nurse's training hospital. So this training, uh, this uh, nurse's dormitory was down here, Spanish Colonial Revival Building from 1930-31. And then this big part of the project up here was phase two. So when we were working on phase one and it would get a little bit hairy, we'd look across the parking lot and go, oh God, <laughs> but it all worked out. And actually, I think that Amcal learned a lot on phase one <laughs> that made phase two a lot uh, smoother, even though it took longer and the building was, you know, many, many, many times the size. So again, we were looking at uh, this 1937 wing right here, 37, 38. This was the 1924 wing that was attached to the 1905 when we go down. And then back here, there's this sort of uh, like a little power plant and laundry and some kind of big public rooms that I'll show you. These are on uh, this uh, sort of service wing back here. This is a, just a Sanborn map of the property showing all the different wings. And then there was also an, another employee's dormitory that had been, um, that had been demolished. 
And so this is phase one, this is the nurse's dormitory. So you can see that it, it you know, it, it had been um, kind of occupied maybe by a few nonprofits uh, who were kind of using the, um, the dormitory rooms as offices, but basically it was, it was pretty empty. Uh, then there's uh, the back of the building. You can see that this, you know, there was the condition of it was, um, was pretty sad. There was this kind of backyard area that had incredible potential and uh, was just, you know, it had been so many years since anybody had used this thing that it was just uh, kind of dead. So we had the original drawings and the architect was H.L. Gilman, who was just a sort of a Santa Fe corporate architect. And um, we had these beautiful drawings that his office had done uh, of, uh, of this building. These are some of the significant spaces inside before the project. So there was a sort of a living room. This is the main entrance hall, um, main entrance hall. And then there were little things like this little kitchen and things like that, um, where you know, we had to figure out how to use, reuse some of these spaces. Um, this is typical conditions inside. There were just these kind of very plain hallways with, um, this is the first floor had this kind of, um, uh, had a, um, a vinyl tile, uh, or, or sorry, asbestos tile um, on the floor. And then upstairs, there was this kind of um, rubber tile. And of course, one of the process, in part of the process of doing their um, initial investigations of the building, they found that a lot of this stuff had asbestos in it, and it ended up being abated. And then we had to figure out how to how to replace it. A lot of things had been abated before we even turned in any of the documentation. Um, so the first part of this, you know, any tax credit project, you basically got three parts: part one, part two, and part three. So part one is establishing that the building is eligible for the National Register or getting it listed if you choose to do that at the outset. Uh, so in that documentation process, what you do is you go through and you take photographs of all the character defining features of the building. And then you write up what essentially mirrors a National Register nomination. Uh, what's the significance of the building per the National Register criteria? And then the second part is an architectural description of the building. So that goes to the state office. And then once that's approved, then you can move on to phase two. So then phase two was where we went through again re-photographed it just to get all the conditions recorded then there's a form that you'll see if you go on the nps website you can look up all these forms but the the basic format of the part two is for each architectural feature of the building whether it's you know hallways or steel windows wood windows you know you kind of separate it down into its component parts um, particular important spaces um, they, uh, you, you basically go through and for each of those, you describe it briefly, and then you say what the work plan for it is. So that's, it, it's a very clear, um, very simple structure. And your challenge then as a person filling it out is to be able to um, make the building digestible to someone who's probably not even going to see it. So between your photographs and your description and your description of each of the, um, each of the features and how it'll be impacted by the work, that's how you're presenting both your building and your project. The part three then basically is a check on the part two to say, here's how it all, all came out. You go back and you take, essentially, usually what you do is just take the same photographs uh, to show how all those things were impacted by the, um, by the construction. So these are all from the part one photos that I'm showing you here. Um, there were some, you know, this, this, the characteristic of this building was that it was a lot of little small rooms. There were 70 uh, units for the, in the dormitory. And then, of course, it had uh, communal bathrooms. And these communal bathrooms had this beautiful tile, like on every, every bathroom had different tile. And there were these crazy, like, purples and golds and blues. And we walked through um, with KFA at the very beginning of the project kind of going, oh, because we knew that all that was going to be lost. And I actually tried very hard to get this tile all salvaged, but there were problems with, um, you know, challenges with the lead regulations and all that that really didn't allow it to happen. So that was one of the really sad losses of the project was that we weren't able to save that stuff. But, you know, we, uh, the thing to do is that you have to be able to justify those losses within the, con within the context of your project. So there was no way that we could lose multiple units of housing in a 23 unit building, which is what it was becoming in order to keep these bathrooms, which had no use. So it's all things that, you know, as you're doing the adaptive reuse, trying to um, make these uh, judgment calls. So um, the other thing that was lost in the building were the corridor walls themselves. That, and those, this is a really important thing that comes up in a lot of preservation tax credits, so I'll mention this specifically. If you have a corridor, a double-loaded corridor, for example, 
and you're going to be impacting the areas on the outside of the corridor, like the rooms or, you know, in the case of the main building, hotel rooms, in the case of this building, dormitory rooms, and other, in other projects I've worked on, you know, offices were being converted to hotel rooms and that sort of thing. The, there's a priority where or there's a, you know, kind of a hierarchy where the corridor itself is a higher, higher in the um, hierarchy than the rooms that are kind of, you know, for more private use. Uh, and then, of course, above the corridors would be, you know, public spaces and things like that. So you have to be able to kind of see the building in terms of what are the most significant spaces, what are the secondary spaces, what are the non-character defining spaces. Um, and then you have to be able to justify what your treatment is for each one of those. So, for example, here we thought that maybe we could reuse all of these wood doors that were all the unit doors. Um, because one of the things you have to do is maintain the rhythm of all those doors in a corridor. And this is something that just drives uh, owners crazy. Um, because for in this case, you know, we're, we're converting 70 dorm units to 23 uh, apartments. So you look down the corridor and you see 70 doors. Which ones actually go to a unit? You're the fire department. You come in an emergency which door actually has people behind it, which one has drywall behind it and it's sealed. So you get a lot of pushback from the fire department about this. Um, and then you're getting it from the other side for MPS where they're saying you've got to be able to maintain all those doors. So since the corridors were coming out themselves because of the hollow clay tile in them, which was a, a collapsing hazard, um, we had to go to a lot of trouble to reconstruct those corridors um, that we were able to bring the ceiling down just a bit in order to fit the HVAC in there. Um, and the, in the other uh, building, there was a different approach taken. Rather than taking the corridor and lowering the ceiling, what they did was there was more space in that building and they were able to run it along the sides, uh, essentially within the units. If you can imagine the chase being on the outside of the, of the corridor in the units. So it comes in from the sides rather than coming down from the top. So there's, you have to kind of work out the ways, um, depending on what the circumstances of the building are, what material is going to be lost any way that you can replace. Um, and then if something is going to be left intact, then you have to figure out a way around it. So this is a, um, this is a shot of what was going on behind the corridor. This is where they, you know, here's this big concrete shell and they've kind of furred out uh, the walls and they built in other partitions and all that to create the apartment units within where the dormitory units used to be. So some of the issues were this re reconfiguration of rooms, replacement of the corridors, um, the alignment of doors that I talked about, lost the tile bathrooms, extensive damage to the roof tiles during their removal. So all the roof tiles that we thought we were going to be able to reuse were cemented together and most of them broke when we took them apart. So we had to decide, okay, what are we going to do with the ones that are left? And we put them in the most visible location. And then we went to a lot of trouble to make sure that the, the color mix of the new tiles would reflect that of the historic tiles and uh, put those back on the less visible locations. I'm gonna go a little faster here. So um, once it was all done, <laughs> um, this disgusting building <laughs> looked really nice. And I should mention also, uh, th this I, I mentioned that this was um, low-income uh, tax credits were involved here. This is senior housing and it low-income senior housing. So uh, the, um, let's see. I have written, oh, it's so it's senior households ages 62 and over with household incomes at or below 50% of the Los Angeles area median income. So this ended up being, you know, the downturn in this case uh, in 2008 really benefited the community here because in the end, what they got was a building for senior citizens who had lived in the community all their lives, most of them, and then were able to get low income housing uh, in, a, in a retirement um, apartment building, essentially. So uh, it was really... Um, you know, kind of a, a real feel-good project for the neighborhood as well, and really met a, a serious need. Um, you know, some of the little details in here, like there were no um, historic light fixtures, so they went and chose things that were compatible. All these are steel windows that, that were uh, rehabilitated. Uh, Spectre did all those steel windows in both buildings. Um, you can see down here that there's radiator covers. Um, all these radiator grills were drawn out in the architect's plan and that specific pattern. And so there were lots of them around the building that were going to get that were going to be lost um, because of changes that were being made, like there were closets coming out and things like that that had been on the corridors. So what we did was we had them um, salvage what they could of these. A lot of them had a big hole cut in them because they, you know, so you could reach in and, and adjust the radiator. <laughs> so uh, we had them go through and um, salvage pieces that they could replace from other parts of the building in the most visible areas. So. 
Um, that's an example of uh, just some of the details that, uh, you know, we're in a building like this with phase one, we felt like there was a lot being lost. And so we wanted to be able to maintain as many of those small details that would give that, um, that would maintain the building, the building's integrity to the extent we could. This is uh, the main um, uh, lobby. There was a lot of conversation about, um, you know, the path of travel between the main lobby and that living room, which is actually down a corridor here, uh, and then has three steps down into it. So you've got a population of senior citizens. Uh, you don't want to have a big, ugly lift. That was the first thing we proposed, and uh, NPS kind of sent us back to the drawing board on that. Uh, eventually, the path of oops, the path of travel ended up being that you go through outside. There's a covered patio, and you take that down and come into the to the other room. So it took a long time to kind of get those kind of compromises uh, agreed to. So there, there's the steps. Uh, that's the lobby down there, and you come down these steps. So there was going to be a big lift here, and instead the path of travel came through this, uh, this exterior covered area. This is the exterior of phase two then. Um, so what happens at the end of phase one is you don't get a part three, and your investor is saying, where's, your, where's the part three? We need to be able to get the money and you're telling us that there's no part three. And um, this is the first time I've done a phase project. So um, what I learned is that you actually just, um, you get uh, what's you know, kind of a preliminary um, agreement from MPS that what you've done so far meets the standards. So once you've done that, um, you're able to give that to your investor and then they um, do what they need to do with it and you move on to phase two. So phase two, um, you can see the building was really in um, rough shape on the exterior as well. This is some of the original features from 1924 that had been kind of um, modernized when the uh, they took off a big cornice up here in the uh, in the uh, 50s, I want to say, uh, or maybe it was in the 30s when the rest of the building was built. But anyway, so there had been changes to the building, and this one had a really long period of significance. So it basically went from 24 when the earliest parts of the building were built up through um, the time, uh, I think in the 50s, when um, uh, there were certain changes that, um, that were identified when the National Register nomination was done um, in the structure of uh, the Santa Fe that ended the period of significance. So here you can see this is just some of the back areas of the building. Um, you know, these are just kind of utilitarian kind of courts and things that were converted into, um, you know, nice areas for people to have a, a patio outdoor space uh, for the residents to sit. This is that back wing um, where you've got the laundry and the power plant back in here and then all these rooms that were kind of uh, doctor's dining rooms and uh, patient's dining rooms and all that sort of thing. Um, this is some of the uh, features before. I mean, some of it was in really rough shape. This, this was like a nice kind of curved desk in here with a terrazzo base and um, uh, just in, you know, just kind of a mess in there because people had used the building for filming as if no one was ever going to need these things again. It was just going down and down and down. So this was the lobby. Uh, this is the corridors, but another funny thing that had happened, and it was a good thing that we um, had people to tell us these things uh, who had been the site manager, a guy who had been the site manager for decades there. These light fixtures were not original. These, even these little transoms were not original. Those had all been added. Um, there's a little clip that we saw from like some Adams Family movie where they go to the hospital and someone is looking up from a gurney and, and that's the perspective of the camera. And so you're, they needed something more interesting to look at on the ceiling during these kinds of shots. And so they added that. There was a chair rail that was added. You know, a lot of things where it looked good because it had all these fake things in it. <laughs> but the truth of the, or the original corridor, again, this is a building that was not significant under, under uh, Criterion C for its architecture. Um, there were some things that had to go. There were other things that were really nice features that we were able to, uh, to maintain and restore. So this is just some of those areas. Um, this is not a chapel. This is actually the nurse's dining room, but at some point someone had made benches for it in order to use it as a chapel in a film. Uh, this is a library that, you know, one day we went and it had been completely set up like a, a sort of old-timey doctor's office. You know, this is all just complete fictions that we had to strip away. <laughs> um, this is what the corridors looked like. Some of them were significant corridors, and then some of them, like the uh, in the north wing, in that 1924 wing, everything had been completely reconstructed. In that case, we were able to completely clear it out and reconstruct it again. Whereas in the areas where it was historic corridors, we maintained the arch of the ceiling, we maintained the walls, we maintained the rhythm of the doors all through there. Um, you can see that it was just very simple kind of metal casing on the, on the doors. 
But you can also see in here that each room had a little bathroom and all those bathrooms again were lost. This is typically what the rooms look like. Um, you know, this looks terrible, but you can get an idea of how nice uh, it would make uh, an apartment, what a nice apartment it would make from the size of the windows, high ceilings and all that. So, um, oops, there's an incomplete sentence there. But so some of the spaces that were reused for compatible uses, one of the my favorite things that KFA came up with was that there were all these remote kitchens on every floor that had interesting tile in them, and they converted them to laundry rooms on every floor. So we didn't end up losing those. Um, there were small dining rooms in that back wing that were converted to offices. Um, the large dining room became the community room. Uh, even the power plant um, has a separate entrance and it became uh, an event and theater space. Some of the things we lost though, um, uh, the big laundry, you know, it's, you know, obviously the laundry was an important part of the um, hospital, but it wasn't necessarily the functions of the hospital itself that were significant. So we, the laundry we were able to um, subdivide into smaller units. Um, exam rooms, labs, restrooms with the tile, those were all lost too. Um, it's kind of like the bathrooms in phase one. You know, they were important to the interpretation of the building, but in the end, uh, we were able to justify for the sake of the adaptive reuse that some of the, a lot of those things had to go. But then we balanced it out with things like, you know, remove, um, keeping those kitchens. So here's some of those spaces. This was all lost, and here these are kind of like uh, exam rooms that had um, glass block. And you really couldn't convert those to apartment units and we tried <laughs> because you can't run plumbing through glass block. You can't run electricity through glass block. And you know, so we eventually had to make a case for it. We documented it fully, had a long conversation with them. And that's where it ended up was that we were able to, to remove some of those things. Um, and you know, as you're going through the project, you sweat all this stuff a lot and it keeps you up at night. <laughs> but in the end, you know, you gotta keep looking at the, at the bigger picture and what, what you're gonna be able to save in the end. So the, this is an example of what these, um, uh, uh, kitchens looked like that were converted to laundry rooms. And then here they are after. So you can see that, um, you know, here on the wall, some of the tile was still there and some of the tile we had to infill and NPS came back and said, well, you've got two slightly different colors of tile in there. And we said, well, we have two choices. A, we can rip out all the tile and have it all be new and all match. Or B, we can just leave holes in the wall where, you know, I mean, it wasn't, it just wasn't practical. It was actually from the same manufacturer and the same color and all that, but it was just slightly different. So in the end, they said, okay, close enough. Um, so all that tile, floor tile and that colorful wainscot and all that was, was saved uh, on each floor, um, all six floors for these. This is a plan of um, what phase two looked like. Here's phase one over here. And then you can see that uh, this is the main lobby and all these uh, patient rooms became um, became apartments on each floor and then this is back ag again where those com communal spaces are you've got a garden slipped in here where I showed you that that kind of concrete court you've got a sunken court down in here that was kind of uh, reinvigorated um, this was a building that was not part of the project that's not owned uh, under the same ownership um, this is actually like a garden area now. They took down this building. This was non non contributing. So one of the big problems we had again with the hollow clay tile. We had this um, system in here that was all terracotta tile, um, but it, it was like a sort of a white base. the The clay base was um, was sort of a, a grayish clay, and um, then you can see the hollow clay tile behind it. So this was not self-supporting, it was actually attached back here to this hollow clay tile. So this is a, a kind of a main corridor that went down to the, to, historically to the kitchen and has some of these big um, uh, dining spaces off of it. But this is a main egress route, so they couldn't have the hollow clay tile remain on it. On the other side of this wall is just plain plaster, and so we thought, great, okay, what if we just put up a membrane on that side that's supposed to hold the hollow clay tile, but the problem is if it falls this way, then it, is, then it blocks the corridor. So in the end, this entire corridor ended up coming out, which was really kind of tra traumatic for everybody. But when we went back in, this is what it looked like. So we spent a lot of time. Um, my advice to you is if you have tile to replicate, go directly to Malibu Ceramics. Do not Pesco. <laughs> Just go directly to them. Talk to Bob Harris. Do not mess around. Because you're, chances are you're going to put in a custom order anyway, and they will come up with a, a matching glaze. It, it was quite amazing what they were able to do. So these are some of the glaze samples that we looked at along the way as they were developing this. So again, you can see this is the old tile. 
Um, some of the details we had to change a little bit, but this is the way that hallway came out. Um, the floor was saved, uh, the tile is all new, and it was just um, unbelievably similar to what was there originally. Uh, this is that big space down there in the bottom that uh, we were talking about that became, this was a sort of a power plant. I didn't have a good uh, picture of it with all the equipment in it because you just couldn't see anything in there. It was so thick with equipment. So this is once it was cleared out uh, and then they added this staircase, which was a bit controversial um, in order it comes down through here in order to get people down onto this main floor. And then they completely cleaned it up. They saved the staircase here, repainted it. Uh, all these windows um, were rehabbed and all of the um, wire glass here, they found a matching wire glass uh, at salvage and were able to, like 80% of the glass was broken. It was unbelievable. Um, and they were able to, to salvage and match that. This is just, uh, you know, the, comparing the, uh, the glass that they, that they had in the building and the glass that they uh, were, um, were proposing to replace it with. Another problem we had was that this is all, um, this is all acoustic tile. It was actual 1930s acoustic tile in all the ceilings. And you can see it's a curved ceiling. Uh, this is an amazingly intact part of it. In most places, it had just fallen. Um, and with the glues that are available today, you just can't get this stuff to stick. And to try to find a product that would approximate what the original texture was was almost impossible. So we tried that route for a while. And then in the end, um, we decided to go with uh, a, um, an acoustic plaster. So then there were a lot of really you know, bad misfires trying to get the acoustic plaster to match. And fortunately, this is only about 20, 25 minutes from my home and office. So I would go over there frequently and they look up there and say, no, 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 no. And then they would try again. And I would keep coming back to the site, but they really, you know, they really tried and eventually they got it right. And it looked really good. Um, you know, of course the, the lumpier it is, the better its acoustic properties are. And that was not gonna work for um, approximating what we had originally on, on the ceiling. So here's the building completed. Um, the, uh, you can see that all this um, original material here on the sort of walk up to the building is all intact. There are steps here around the back of this wing. There's a big ramp that goes up on the parking lot side. So the, um, the main access point is actually through the back of the building uh, and goes into that wing where all those public rooms are. So it's actually not um, like a back door. It's, it goes into a sort of a major part of the building. This is an area down in front that was uh, completely deteriorated in terms of the paving and all that. Um, this is sort of a secondary entrance. All the features from around this had been removed. Um, the paving was in terrible shape. The landscaping was kind of non-existent. Um, this is that area after they rehabbed it. So you can see all the curb lines and the, um, uh, the planters and all that are the same. They came up with a very simple solution for how to frame out that door, uh, put in just a very simple compatible paving that has a, just a little bit of a score in it. Um, so that, that this was where the ambulances would pull up. This is again, that exterior, uh, and then this is after. They pulled all of the um, paint off of the stonework that was framing the 1924 part of the building. All of this area here, this whole base of the building actually was, uh, um, all of this is stone now that was exposed um, that had been painted for many years. Of course, when they took the paint off, they saw it had terrible graffiti markings on it that were really difficult to get out, but um, they did a fantastic job getting those out. The main lobby, this is the way it looks now. Um, so this was, you know, it was just kind of like all of this uh, terrazzo down around the bottom was all discolored and broken and all that. Um, they had water leaks in through here. Um, this is just like a contact paper finish on here. <laughs> um, so then uh, the, the designer of this um, project was, uh, the uh, interior designer was um, Joe Carmen, and she just did a really wonderful job of making it actually feel less like a haunted hospital and more like someone's home, which is just really quite a job. <laughs> this is before, this is in the main lobby. This is kind of looking into that same area after. This is, those men are sitting like right here in this, in this next picture. So all of this wood is original. You can see like there's this big scratch right here. That's kind of the only thing that they really couldn't get out. So they did an amazing job of um, uh, getting all this wood cleaned up. It has this little inlay detail and um, they just did a great job on that. And then just, you know, put down a simple rug and some curtains and new light fixtures and really kind of made it uh, 
made it feel much more comfortable in there. Uh, this is that lower area where I showed you that doorway where the ambulance, when the ambulance turn around, um, when you came in through that doorway, this is what you saw. And this is how it ended up afterwards. So you can see that they saved that whole terrazzo base. They saved the wood counter, the terrazzo base back here. And then all this flooring is uh, marmoleum. So that's new throughout. And it replaced a lot of the flooring materials that some of which were hot with uh, asbestos. And then they also made this kind of an entry uh, where the residence mailboxes would be and that sort of thing. This is that um, nurse's dining room. You can see it has this nice um, scored concrete floor. This part of the beam was original. This part had been added for a movie set. These had been added for a movie set. This thing was not original because there, there is no uh, exit door there. This is what was behind that. This was hiding behind that fake door. So it's an, an actual original plaster and tile feature with this multicolored tile on it. So, um, I mean, this is, the whole ceiling had been covered with, um, it was black and it wasn't from cigarette smoke over the years. It was one particular um, shoot where um, someone came like, you know, came rolling through the uh, the room with some kind of fireworks going off and it was the pyrotechnics that had created the blackness on the, on the ceiling. So they had to, they had to fix that, they had to erase all that, <laughs> literally erase it with erasers. <laughs> and then uh, this is another space uh, that, another one of those spaces in that same corridor. This is a, a false wall that had been inserted in there. And uh, so it was, it's, it's actually, the room is actually three bays wide and one of them is a doorway, but this, this wall they took out that wasn't originally there and restored the full uh, volume of the room. But you can see along the way, it was um, uh, in pretty bad shape. And then once they cleaned it and painted it, this is the ceiling here. There's those two windows, and then this is where that that uh, wall had been inserted. So now the whole volume of the room. This is again another one of those little tile features. Uh, this is an exaggeratedly bad corridor. Again, this is from uh, from movie set use. They didn't all look this bad, and now all of them look like this. So it really, um, you know, they took a, li a little bit of design liberty with these um, the pattern in the flooring. I think part of this had to do with kind of trying to orient people and also just to kind of give a little bit of life to the corridor. Um, but you can see here, this is that, um, that treatment on the ceiling uh, that replicates essentially that um, kind of uh, reveal that was around the edge in the, um, in the pattern. So, I mean, in the, uh, in the ceiling, the tile. That's uh, just a typical elevator lobby before and then after. So they all have these nice, you know, very generous spaces at, at, at each elevator. Uh, looking out over the neighborhood. The views of the neighborhood here are wonderful too. And that's uh, phase two and phase one of the project. We'll be happy to answer any questions about it. Barbara. Okay. Um, for the, the congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> congratulations. It's a brilliant project. We're all Jennifer. really proud of it. Thanks. I'm sure. Um, Couple questions um, mm -hmm. for phase one: the doors in the corridor yeah. problem. Um, how did you um, end up reconciling that? And number two, I wasn't clear exactly. That, I mean, I heard about the hollow clay tile, but mm -hmm. the overall structural system mm -hmm. of both buildings. Would be uh, both buildings were poured-in-place concrete, so they actually um, the shell of them was very strong and you know perfectly sound. It was just the infill walls that we had trouble with. So um, that's, that's where we had to address some problems. Um, it was not a problem on phase two in the corridors, but on phase one it was. So what we ended up doing on phase one is part of the problem was the hollow clay tile. The problem with not being able to reuse the doors is that the doors were probably a half an inch too narrow, even under the State Historic Building Code for, for um, wheelchairs. So uh, that idea that we had had where we said, save all this material until we figure out what to do with this problem. They saved it all. Some of them ended up getting reused as closet doors where the width didn't matter. And so that was a, kind of a nice way to at least save some of the material in the building. The unit doors themselves are wood. And then instead of doing something that looks like a door, um, there was basically a little reveal and then there was kind of a stained plywood panel so that um, you know, one of the things, of course, that they do let you do, and part of it has to do with this fire to fire emergency problem, is that you can remove the hardware from the doors that are not in use. 
Um, I've seen other, another KFA project that was a tax credit project that I worked on a long time ago was the Pegasus uh, downtown, which was the old uh, mobile oil building. In that case, what they did was um, they put a little shelf at each door that's being used that's an active door so that there could be you know like a little people could put a little vase on it or something like that just so that you could see that you know you are here you've entered a you're about to enter a unit and rather than just being a, a, a kind of a passive panel that you're walking by so usually that's what they end up doing and that's what we ended up doing here the doors in in phase two had not originally been wood they were just like metal doors i think but they were all gone by the time we got there they'd all been tucked i think basically just for safety reasons um because you with all these random people using the building you didn't want to be able to close doors so um they for the 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 uh, non-active doorways in that building we painted them the same color as the wall but there was that still the original little reveal that um and nps was kind of called us on that um but we were able to push back and convince them that this was the best solution just because there had never been anything that interesting there that we got and we didn't get rid of anything and that you can still see the rhythm of it, um, but that it, it you know it makes a 